here this afternoon to talk to you about Heidegger on Hölderlin on Nature's Gleaming. Now, sometime after July 1970, Heidegger composed a brief but bright commentary on several of Hölderlin's so-called last poems. And we can't pinpoint the date exactly, but it's sometime after July of 1970. So it's very late in Heidegger's lifetime of thinking. Heidegger died in May of 1976. So this is within five years of his death. And so really one of his final statements on Hölderlin and on Hölderlin's poetry. The principal poem considered by Heidegger bears the title Autumn and opens with the line, nature's gleaming is higher revealing. The complete poem reads in our translation and all the translations, both of Hölderlin's poetry and of Heidegger's commentary are by my co-translator, Marie Goebel and myself. And the translations of Hölderlin's poetry are geared in some way towards Heidegger's particular reading, his elucidation of the poems. So this poem, Autumn, reads this way. Nature's gleaming is higher revealing, where with many joys the day draws to an end. It is the year that completes itself in resplendence, where fruit come together with beaming radiance. Earth's orb is thus adorned, and rarely clamors sound through the open field. The sun warms the day of autumn mildly, the fields lie as a great wide view. The breezes blow through boughs and branches, rustling gladly. When then already to emptiness the fields give way, the whole meaning of this bright image lives as an image, golden splendor hovering all about. During the 1960s, Heidegger had commended this poem to others, and it had apparently become a favorite of his. This is not at all surprising because, as I would like to try to illuminate here today, Heidegger, nearing the end of his life, had come to find in this particular poem a fitting saying of what he considered to be the fundamental matter, die Sache selbst, of his lifetime of thinking. After setting out the poem in full, Heidegger reflects that Hölderlin composed these lines one year before his death, which, in Heidegger's words, brought to an end the long period of the dark night, a night replete with mystery, a nighting that grants such saying." Unquote. It is clear that Heidegger considered Hölderlin's madness, the madness of Hölderlin's uh, later years, last years, as a kind of divine madness and not as a mere mental disorder or derangement. In the dark night of his later years, Hölderlin could see what others could not, and therefore his last poems are capable of awakening us to what Heidegger says is the astonishing and to the wonder of the, quote, extraordinary in the ordinary, unquote. Heidegger agrees with Norbert von Hellingrath's observation that there is a remarkable clarity and dignity to the language that speaks in Hölderlin's last poems. Only by proceeding with this insight, Heidegger adds, can there be success in the effort to properly hear and thoughtfully interpret Hölderlin's last poetizing? And so he begins by addressing the first line of the poem, nature's gleaming is higher revealing. Before continuing, let us pause a moment to consider our translation of this line. The German reads, das glänzen der Natur ist Höres erscheinen. Das Glänzen, 
is a favorite word of Hölderlin's and of Heidegger's, as will become more evident in what follows. But oftentimes this word is translated into English simply as shining. Yet this is inadequate. Das Glänzen requires a more striking translation, and English obliges with a number of alliterative words that carry forward both the form of the German word and its distinctive sense. Gleaming, glistening, glimmering, glittering, glowing. Nature does not just shine, it gleams. Furthermore, note that this gleaming is a higher appearing or a higher revealing. Appearing for erscheinen is perfectly suitable, but the German word also suggests something more elevated, sublime, and holy, and for this reason revealing seems to be the better choice. Even so, for now the key matter is this. Nature's distinctive gleaming is a manifestation, indeed a higher kind of manifestation. But what exactly does this mean? We must follow Heidegger's reading further. Considering more closely the phrase nature's gleaming, he observes that, quote, we think of nature outside, the landscape, unquote. And he cites a few lines from Hölderlin's poem, The Stroll, Der Spaziergang. You lovely images in the valley, such as gardens and tree, and then the footbridge, the narrow, the stream barely seen, how beautiful from bright distance gleams to the eye the glorious image of the landscape. These images of the landscape are resplendent, but Heidegger cautions us, quote, yet the landscape is not yet nature itself. Landscape gathered around human beings and inclined toward them indeed lets appear nature in an initial gleaming." Unquote. Note the distinction. The landscape, Landschaft, is not nature itself, Natur selbst. What Heidegger is articulating here should be very familiar to us. It is another saying of the ontological difference between beings and being itself. For some reason, some recent Heidegger scholars have presumed that the later Heidegger abandoned his earlier guiding notion of the ontological difference. Certainly, he became wary of the expression over time because he found that he could not fully free it from traditional philosophical thinking. But the matter of the difference between being and beings remained fundamental to his thinking to the very end. It may be true that in later years he became troubled that the ontological difference, this particular naming of the matter, came to be misconstrued as referring to nothing more than the traditional metaphysical difference between a concretely existing entity and its essence, that is, between a being and its beingness. Or, in the language of the modern philosophy of the subject, between an object and its objectiveness. Indeed, he readily admitted in later reflections that all previous Western philosophy had recognized and thematized in one way or another a difference, but he insisted that this was no more than a derivative difference, a difference in the realm of beings and not the primordial and fundamental difference, difference, Untersheet between being, that is, the temporal letting, giving, granting itself, and beings, that is, all that issues forth from out of the being process or the being way, as I prefer to name it. Accordingly, we should not be surprised that in this very late elucidation of Hölderlin's poem, again, sometime after 1970, 
Heidegger in effect restates and reaffirms his long-standing consideration of the matter of the ontological difference by making the distinction here between nature and landscape. Nature, as he says in an initial gleaming, lets shine forth everything that belongs to the landscape. He cites a few lines from Hölderlin's poem, The Merry Life, Das Fröhliche Leben, to make the same point. Fairest landscape, where the road makes its way evenly through the middle, where the moon, the pale, rises, when the evening wind comes up, where nature very simple. He draws our attention especially to the last line, where nature very simple. And he observes, quote, the landscape with the multiplicity of its images can let appear simple nature only because the landscape gleams from out of nature, which as the simple is of divine essence, unquote. Thus nature is the simple, the very simple, which allows to come to presence all that is present in the landscape. Nature is the one and simple way whereby all things come to presence and as such, quote, is of divine essence, unquote. That is, it is the holy, if we recall one of Heidegger's favored names for being itself drawn from his earlier readings of Hölderlin's poetry, those readings in the late 1930s and the early 1940s. Further, to underscore this theme of how the divine one, uh, the hen in Greek, being, nature, allows all, the panta, panta in the Greek, beings, the multitude of things of the landscape. He cites several lines from Hölderlin's poem, Contentment, Die Zufriedenheit. The tree that flourishes, the crown of branches, the flowers that ring the bark of the trunk, are from divine nature. They are one life, because above this, heaven's breezes lean their way. Crystallizing his point, Heidegger states, quote, in the look of the landscape which nature grants, the gleaming of nature is higher revealing." Unquote. In other words, the untold abundance of luminous images of the landscape show themselves to us. They shine forth to us. They open to us and address us. But that whereby everything is manifest to us is nature, being. Furthermore, this allowing, letting, giving, granting of beings that is nature, being, is itself manifest to us in a unique way. It is precisely the higher revealing, appearing or manifesting, that is glimpsed and named by Hölderlin in the poem. Hölderlin also speaks in these lines of heaven's breezes leaning sich neigen, toward all things, with the suggestion of their bending in a concernful, sheltering, sparing, protecting way toward all that is. This is the language of the poet's last poems that resonated so powerfully with the later Heidegger. That is, the language of nature, fusis, being, inclined toward us, toward all things, in a gesture of gentle nurturing, and preserving. One could well argue, as I would, that just this perspective is what is so compelling and attractive in the later Heidegger's thinking about being. But at the very least, we should take note that long gone in such later reflections is his early view, and we might speculate and say perhaps the view to be expected of a younger man, but long gone in these reflections 
is that talk of the anxiety and strife that are constitutive of the relation between being and Dasein. Heidegger's commentary turns to the matter of time, and of course this remains central to his thinking to the end. Uh, the uh, quote here is rather extended, um, so um, please permit me to read the whole um, passage here. So Heidegger says this, the manifold of images in the manifold of seasons is pervaded throughout by the one fold of the year. The gleaming of nature lets appear the passage of the seasons. The gleaming of nature is not a state but a happening. In the passage of the seasons the year completes itself. Even so, this passage is not the mere one after the other of the times of the year. Rather, in each season, the other seasons appear, pointing ahead and pointing back as they interchange with one another. The gleaming of nature is a revealing in which ever already the whole of the year shines throughout and thus constantly anticipates the individual times of the year. In this manner, the higher of the gleaming revealing shows itself. That is, what is peculiar and proper to nature shows itself. That's the end of the quote there. So the first two lines here recall for us again Heidegger's earlier renderings of Heraclitus' saying of the hen panta as one is all. That is, the one, nature, being, lets be and gathers together all beings, the landscape, and the seasons. Yet the one that he is speaking about is not to be confused with any kind of metaphysical entity. As he makes clear, the gleaming of nature is not a state or condition, but a happening, geschehen. Nature, being, is indeed temporal, dynamic, flowing, unfolding, but the temporality of nature itself, being itself, must not be construed simply as the mere one after the other of the times of the year. We readily recognize that this critique of time as a mere succession of moments or nows goes back to being in time and to even earlier reflections in the 1920s. With these lines, Heidegger reprises one of the most fundamental themes of his life's work, but it is a return within the turn, di Kera, in his thinking. That is, although his criticism of linear time here is essentially the same as it was in being in time, nevertheless, it is no longer a critique that proceeds from a phenomenological analysis of Dasein's fundamental temporality, Zeitlichkeit. Rather, his reference is to nature itself, being itself. Nature itself offers the evidence of, shows to us, this more elemental temporality in the way, for example, that buds appear on trees in the dead of winter, in recollection of summer, and in anticipation of spring. The gleaming of nature itself, again being itself, reveals this to us. Quote, the gleaming of nature is a revealing in which ever already the whole of the year shines throughout and thus constantly anticipates the individual times of the year, unquote. From that passage, the longer passage that I read. And so what we glean from this is that Dasein's fundamental authentic temporality as it was worked out in being and time takes on a new significance. Dasein's temporality is structured as it is only because it is correlated to the temporality, the time-space, Zeitraum, 
of being itself. Being unfolds Dasein. Being temporalizes Dasein. This is the leitmotif of the later Heidegger's thinking on time, and therein we recognize a principal effect of Dikera in his thinking after being and time. Heidegger looks once more to the poem Autumn and seeks to better understand the character of the higher revealing that is announced in the first verse line. <clears throat> the key, he suggests, is to be found in the last two lines. The whole meaning of this bright image lives as an image, golden splendor hovering all about. He reads these lines this way, quote, the bright image is the shining look of the autumnally completed year. Yet the whole of this completion lives as one single image that is formed, that is, shows itself to non-sensuous seeing as golden splendor, which hovers about everything and thus appears as the whole meaning." Unquote. Now this explication admittedly is dense and difficult to follow, but his meaning appears to be that nature, again the one, the simple being, which unfolds the landscape, all beings, manifests itself to us in a special manner that is different from the way that discrete things are manifest to us. Nature shows itself to us, but not as a being, not as something in the landscape. Therefore, we see nature being differently from the way that we see things, individual, concrete, specific, particular things. Not an ordinary seeing or perception, but a special seeing that glimpses the whole process of the unfolding of all things, the very presencing itself of everything. Presencing itself, nature, being, is a golden splendor that suffuses, bathes, hovers about everything that is. Heidegger does not mean to say, I think, that this special seeing is non-sensuous in the strict sense. Rather, he wishes only to distinguish our seeing of nature being from our usual seeing of things. And again, we can see nature being only because presencing itself is manifest to us in this special higher way. Since the manifestation of nature is unique, he can maintain, not in this particular commentary, but in other statements in these same years, that being is relative to beings in apparent. But to repeat, this means only that being is no being, that nature is not the landscape. Being is the no thing, the nothing, that nonetheless shines out brightly to those who can see in this special way. There is no question then that for Heidegger, nature, the one, the simple being, manifests itself to us. It is the higher revealing that Hölderlin heralds. This higher manifestation is gleaming and golden, and he observes that these are favorite words of Herlin's poetizing. What he does not mention, however, is that they are also favorite words of his own thinking. In the later work, there are numerous instances of his use of these words, and he had undertaken an excursus on these and related words in Pindar's is me an ode number five, and, and that's in an undelivered, 
lecture course, which, as far as we know, he probably prepared for 1942. And it is a volume that has not been translated into English yet. But there is this section uh, where he comments on Pindar, and in particular, Pindar's uh, naming of, as he says, Pindar's naming of being itself as gold. So being shines forth in a unique manner, and the uniqueness is captured especially by the poetic words gleaming, glensen, and golden. Hence, Heidegger comments, speaking as much for himself as for Hölderlin, and again, this is a rather extended uh, quote, but it's an important one. So please allow me to um, read this more lengthy passage. Heidegger says, Golden names the highest and richest gleaming, the most luminous and most pure shining. The golden gleaming hovers about the whole, forms its wholeness, and is the completing. Nevertheless, higher revealing cannot be considered simply as a lacking remainder to be added on. The completing is not a supplement. Rather, it brings forth in the first place the orb of the wholeness of the whole that hovers about everything, just as a shining wreath wreathes everything that appears. The higher revealing happens in the gleaming that completes. This is nature, allows nature to linger as itself, and in this way, accordingly, is nature divine." Unquote. Nature, being, shows itself as the gleaming whole that allows all beings to be and may be likened to a shining wreath that wreathes everything that appears. As this radiant orb of the wholeness of the whole, nature, being, is the divine, the holy. Most assuredly, this does not speak to any kind of traditional ontotheology. Nonetheless, this language does reflect the later Heidegger's profound and abiding reverence for nature as fusis, as the unceasing, emerging, lingering, passing away of all beings and things, and of his experience of the essential joy that comes with our releasement to and harmonizing with the being way. Nature being das heitere, the bright and joyful itself, and our relation to nature being, is for him the brighter bliss spoken of in Hölderlin's line of verse, when out of heaven brighter bliss pours forth. Finally, he returns once more to the line of the poem, nature's gleaming is higher revealing. He observes that in the end, this verse line is perhaps best elucidated by Hölderlin himself through another poem of his, a very special poem because it was probably composed on the last day of his life. The title of the poem is Die Aussicht, The View. And I would note that it is hardly known to English readers since no translation of it appears in any major collection of Hölderlin's poems. According to Heidegger, this poem is Hölderlin's final gift to us. And he continues by saying, it opens to those who hear a view into the being of the poet who speaks from out of the silent brightness of the dark night of his spirit that has come to rest. The poem is a lasting gift wherein the poet's glimpse of the essence shelters in the simple word the whole meaning of everything that appears 
in order to entrust it to our language as the view for all who see. Heidegger presents the poem in, in full, and here it is in our translation. The view. When into the distance passes the life of people dwelling, where into the distance glimmers the time of the vines, comes also thereby the empty fields of summer, the forest with its dark image appears. That nature completes the image of the seasons, that nature stays as the seasons glide along in haste, is from fulfillment. Then high heaven gleams upon the people as trees are wreathed with blooms. Although Heidegger does not comment further on this poem, we can readily understand why he found it to be a culminating poetic statement of what he had attempted to say about the poem Autumn. The first stanza speaks to the temporality of nature itself, wherein and whereby all things, including ourselves, sojourn. The second stanza brings his fundamental message home in this one line, quote, that nature stays as the seasons glide along in haste. All that is given comes and goes, arrives and departs, but the giving itself, nature, being, stays, that is, remains one, whole, simple, complete. All things flow from out of fulfillment, nature, and from out of nature, high heaven, there gleams, there pours forth upon us, people dwelling, a wholesomeness that makes us whole and brings us into the fullness of our essencing. For the later Heidegger especially, the gleaming, glistening, glimmering, glittering, glowing that is the manifestness of being to Dasein, the phos at the very core of Feinistai, calls forth from us wonder and astonishment and great joy, brightens, lightens, and opens us, inclines our thinking toward thanking, and humbles us into recognizing the limit of all our saying, language, meaning. Or, as the poet expressed this, cited so approvingly by Heidegger at the close of his commentary. Yet so very simple the images, so very holy these, that one is really often fearful of describing these. Thank you all very much. <laughs>